before we talk about your work, I always like to know about the films that make filmmakers. So like, what are, what's the first moment you remember just really having your face ripped off by a score <laughs> for from a project or a movie? Yeah, maybe not a full score, but it's the 20th Century Fox logo written by Alfred Newman. Mm. Um, that I associate the most with Star Wars. Um, when I was a kid, putting in VHS tapes of Star Wars and you know that 20th Century Fox logo comes on. It's so iconic. And for me, it does mean that Star Wars is about to start. So it's really such a great little piece of music. Um, and yeah, it's a, a little tune that you hum and that you recognize and that becomes associated um, with very specific things. I mean, what better piece of film music than that? So um, yeah, yeah, that was it. Absolutely. Yeah. I always I love that you mentioned, like you think of a certain movie yeah. after that, because I have all these different, like the Warner Brothers logo. I always expect Superman, like immediately following that logo or like Paramount. It's like, we're going to Indiana Jones. Like there's always those, right. those connection points. Um, I for... think of Paramount as um, uh, uh, coming to America. I always expect oh, really? to go flying over the mountain and into. <laughs> That's um, so funny. Coming to America. And what was the other one you mentioned? Um, Warner Brothers oh, is yeah. always, because with the Superman theme like for any of the superman movies and then small the reason for me is because i used to love smallville and i would watch on dvd and it would be like the warner brothers logo but they always added like a couple notes of the superman theme at the end of the warner brothers like theme tune and so every time i hear it without that it sounds like it's missing something right (laughs) so right um or yeah 20th century fox yeah star wars is for sure like you expected to go dead silent long time ago and then we're off so um yeah i mean so at, at an early age, were you like already musical and then you started getting into movies and noticing like, hey, this is a way to express that? Or was it something where it's like, you know, you liked movies, you were interested in music or you were like the music. So you got into it. Like, how did you start actually picking up instruments and performing yourself? Yeah, um, I wasn't obsessed with any one particular thing as a kid. I was pretty well rounded. I liked music i like movies i like sports um i liked school you know it really wasn't like i liked art you know i i I did i did theater a little bit you know and and dance you know like a show choir you know Mm. so it wasn't really just like one thing um i did um i played in band i played trumpet in in band and you know when i got to um high school i started uh composing for the jazz band writing jazz charts and that was my like one of my earlier you know, entries into, into composing, um, in the film music side, you know, it, other than what we were just talking about with the 20th century Fox logo, it wasn't something that I honed in on. Um, one of the earlier examples of something that really caught my attention was the Jurassic park score. Mm. Um, I was at the perfect age. I was 10 years old, uh, 11 years old when that came out. Um, I know my, I remember my family went to see uh, sleepless in Seattle in the neighboring, uh, uh, theater and I was over by myself watching Jurassic Park and um, which maybe I don't recommend for an 11 year old is a li- little bit scary but um, I remember being really excited by the um, the journey to the island queue mm-hmm. which is when the helicopter is flying towards the island and we get the big uh, theme uh, for the first time on those exteriors and I was really interested in how they got the, the the big trumpet fanfare to line up every time they cut out of the helicopter, the theme would play. Mm-hmm. And then they cut back into the helicopter, be dialogue and they have some underscoring music. And then they cut back outside and the theme would play again. And I was really fascinated. Like, how did they get it to line up exactly like that? Right. And, you know, and we were off from there. Yeah. That's super cool. So, when you looked forward to your life, like the the classic, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, was it just musician or did that seem like that's, that's a really fun passion. That's not a viable career path. It wasn't really something I thought of as a career path for a long time. Um, it, it, I remember in like maybe sixth grade, it was like dress up as like something you want to be when you grow up and, mm-hmm. and bring in like props. And I came as an engineer. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to like build things. And I took like, I was in like an architecture club when I was in grade school. 
Like I really liked engineering. I also at one point thought I might be um, like a designer of indie race cars mm. and be that kind of engineer or yeah. build bridges, that kind of engineer. So uh, I was really into math and science as well as music. So it, it, I thought that that felt like a job. I didn't know being a, a musician or being a composer was a job. Um, it wasn't until maybe that I was in college that where I was, I was actually an engineering major at the University mm -hmm. of Wisconsin, Madison, but I took, you know, I kept taking electives in music composition, music theory. Uh, I played in a jazz band as well. And I just kept music going as on the side. And it wasn't until I realized I'd been spending so much of my time on electives and not my actual mm -hmm. core curriculum that maybe I should just be doing this. Mm -hmm. um, that actually came after I scored my first student film for my uh, old friend, um, Evan Pessis. And, you know, I was kind of hooked after that. It was such a wonderful experience putting the music to the picture like that. Yeah. What, what's the first time that you actually monetized that ability? Like where you got your foot in the door and, okay, this is actually a viable path. This is like something I can make work for me. Um, how did that kind of come about? I mean, knowing that it could be a full-time career monetarily was not something, you know, it took a long time after uh, graduating from USC to get stable. But uh, my very first paying job came when I was an undergrad uh, back in 2006. It was after I had done a summer internship at a uh, production office, a film production mm -hmm. office as an office PA. I did a lot. Uh, I did a lot of script coverage and I went on set to be a PA a couple of times. Um, my, my dad knew that I wanted to be a film composer and that I wanted to be out in Hollywood. And we don't have any, we didn't have any connections in Hollywood other than mm -hmm. an accountant that my dad knew um, named Larry Lottman. And um, he worked at a, a, a film and music entertainment was the name of that production. Um, the late uh, John Daly producer of uh, mm -hmm. Platoon and, and many others. Mm -hmm. uh, he, that was his production company on the Miracle Mile. And uh, yeah, I just spent the summer with them because it was just a way to get introduce myself to LA, introduce myself to Hollywood. So that had nothing to do with music, but you know, it was a great way to just get started in um, Hollywood. And remind me what the actual question was. <laughs> yeah, like I got off track. Yeah, what was your, like your first paying job? Right. You know, and how you kind of got into that. And and I, I do want to ask. Maybe this leads into it, but doing the production assistant route, being on set, like obviously you're usually coming in at a different point in the process now on projects. Like, was that helpful? Like looking back, do you think you learned a lot during that time that has helped you now? Or do you think it was a good time just to get acquainted with the industry? Yeah. I don't think it necessarily had some kind of lasting impact other than getting to know a few people and getting to know what it's like to be mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Uh, and it, yeah, looking back, it is nice to know a little bit more about production by being on set. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's nothing that you can't learn from, you know, a book or a behind the scenes. So I didn't it wasn't that impactful. The reason I brought that up is because um, Tim Shiner, who was the producer there that I worked with uh, closely, he was the one that recommended me mm -hmm. to an independent uh, film called American Fork. They needed a couple of source music cues like for a restaurant or a radio and he recommended me and yeah from from my little from the studio in wisconsin uh as an undergrad i i wrote these instrumental background cues and yeah got a check for them and it was my, <laughs> my first time that's super cool getting... super cool um yeah so just where did you kind of go from there and like how was it how long a process was it from like okay here's a couple of side gigs to okay i feel like there's something forming here like this is me really coming to my own um and seeing this like again being like a full-time thing as opposed to hey that's cool i got to do this little piece of music for this project here and there but what am i actually going to do you know right so as an undergrad when i turned my attention away from engineering and into music you know that was the beginning of mm -hmm. that process to it's a longer story than I'll get into right now, unless sure. you want to come back to it later. Um, switching my major it was very convoluted, but I ended up becoming a full-time music major. Hmm. 
And that is talking about earlier how I was like a well-rounded child. That was the time where I became obsessed. I just absolutely became obsessed with film music and movies. And I watched what, like all the like uh, commentary, like composer commentary on DVDs mm-hmm. at the time. Like there used to be um, a resource, um, soundtracks.net, where they would list all the DVDs that had that extra feature where mm-hmm. either the score was isolated, an isolated score, or sometimes it was isolated score with commentary, mm-hmm. uh, like the, the Matrix. You can mm-hmm. watch the whole movie with the score by itself. And then in between, you hear Don Davis talking about how he did what he did, why he did what he did, the process, the sounds. I mean, that was for an aspiring film composer. That was a great education. Well, it's, um, it's cool. Like, I mean, uh, I remember tomorrow never dies. The DVD had David Arnold's soundtrack, like isolated. So you could watch the whole movie with no dialogue, no effects, just the score. And like, I'm not musically minded at all. Um, but it was such a cool thing because it just proved like, music can tell a story like you could follow that movie a hundred percent just listening to his score and seeing right. those images was so cool. right um the dark crystal one of mm. my favorite childhood movies that one has a great isolated score track on the dvd um so and, and in addition to watching and listening uh reading there's plenty of books there's mm. even more now but there were plenty of film scoring books at the time which was my first education in like what film composers actually do and how they do it. The first one I read was um, The Real World by Jeff Rona, which is now on its like third edition. But back then it was, um, it was my first like window into like how the mechanics of film scoring actually work. And in that book, he mentions uh, USC, uh, the scoring for motion pictures and television program, and basically framed it as anybody who's anybody you know, aspiring to be a film composer goes to that program. Um, now there's several other pro- great programs, right. you know, Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music, and um, which is like international, and there's other film scoring programs at other universities. But um, at the time, that was how I saw the world. Like, I, if I want to be a film composer, I have to go to USC. So I just kind of geared my next couple years of school, like, how do I, how do I get mm-hmm. there? And that was um, writing specific types of music, you know, film score oriented style. There's no such thing really as film music other than, you know, it when you hear it. Right. You know, there, there is like a kind of an accepted vocabulary and um, emotional dramatic style that is associated with film music, even though technically film music can be anything in a film. But yeah, I, I learned more about what you might call traditional film music and how to write that. And so Uh, I started writing more of that, doing um, orchestral, we had these orchestral recording workshops where you could write a piece for the orchestra and get it, um, get it read and and recorded to um, kind of learn about like what you did right, what you did wrong, because writing a piece of music is nothing until it comes alive by the orchestra Mm -hmm. if you're writing orchestral music. Um, So I did that and learned a lot and took those pieces and, and put it towards my application for USC. Yeah. Do you, do you still, do you still look at like school being an essential, you know, cause at the time you said that was your idea, like, okay, you got to go to school, learn how to do this. Anybody that's going to do it. Do you still have that outlook? Like if you were talking to someone who was following your kind of dream path, would you say that's step one for you? Like you got to go do this. Or would you say if you're a talented musician, like just start going at it, you know? Yeah, I would say I don't think that you need to go to school like the academic traditional Mm -hmm. path of school in terms of um, becoming a successful musician or being a successful film composer. But you have to get an education, you know, Mm -hmm. one way or another. Um, There are plenty of ways to get an education in this world. It can, you know, just getting out into the world, meeting and talking to people, YouTube, rabbit holes um it's etc and the thing about usc like once you get there or berkeley you know yeah you learn a lot and there's you actually have specific class work but really the the network of that peer group that you're in 16 to 20 people that are mm-hmm. your friends and colleagues you're in the trenches with for a full year like those become some of your greatest resources as your career buds you 
lean on each other for for help and for recommendations mm -hmm. and you know still some of those relationships 12 years 14 years later um, are some of my greatest relationships and have been most influential in my developing career um, so that's your peer group then there's the the, the teachers professors guest mm -hmm. lecturers all those people that you form relationships with um, the musicians and the recording demos that you get to do all this kind of jump starts your path about five years i would say mm -hmm. um you, you you get in one year what it might take you five or more years to do on your own they point you where to go who to talk to who to meet and why mm -hmm. and then from there you, you do as you do but it, i can't think of any better like launching pad than that is it absolutely necessary like if you're someone who can't afford to go to usc because it's definitely very expensive then no you're not that's not the only way by any means of becoming a film composer, but it's just, you know, a really good path and a proven path. On, on the flip side, what do you think is the biggest thing that you got into the industry and then went, holy crap, like school did not prepare me for this. Like, the, like, was there anything that you were like, oh, this is a lot different than what I expected, or this is something that I wish they would have told me about, you know, at some point during my time there to prepare me for this? Well, I do think that the preparation was pretty damn well-rounded. So um, there wasn't a ton that was missing. Um, I mean, all the late, all the late nights and sometimes difficult personalities that you might work with mm -hmm. that, that definitely was applicable. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. We might have to come back to that one. I don't have a, a yeah, great answer for that. No on top of my head. Well, I wanted to ask you because, you know, I think we all, have an idea like when you hear of a certain role everybody has their idea of like what a director does what a producer does like there's all these stereotypes that come in and i think everybody would go like okay composer they do music you know like that's there's a there's a baseline level there of understanding but you mentioned like studying and you're like i want to find out what a composer actually does how do they time out these things like how do they work so can you kind of answer i mean what does yeah. a composer do? Like, what is the role that you find yourself in and how does that kind of functionally play out beyond just like, oh, they're writing music and then they're just going to match right. that to a movie, you know? Um, how would you describe your job? I mean, at a base level, it is, it's, your job is a storyteller mm -hmm. and your job as a composer is no different really than any other role, cinematographer, costume designer, editor, you're all serving the director, the producers, um, but the story and, and, and trying to make the best story possible. So the, the tools are different and the, you know, uh, placement in the assembly line is mm -hmm. different, but the job is essentially the same. It's like, how can we funnel this dramatically emotionally into the story that we want to tell? And, you know, oftentimes, that is the director's vision and they have a very clear and specific vision on what story they want to tell and why. And it's how as a composer in the scene and as a whole, can I serve that? And you get information, you know, as much, as many times as you watch a film uh, to score it, you can't learn as much about it as you can from having the director sit next to you and tell you exactly why he or she made that this film and what, they're trying to express in this moment and then trying to translate that into music. We're basically, you know, a storytelling translator, mm -hmm. just using it, using a different language other than the script writer has their language. The editor has their language and composers have their own language as well. Yeah. Are, are you typically coming in after the film has been shot or is it, or does it depend? Are you sometimes starting your work while they're filming and then coming in and then aligning it? Like, at what point are you stepping into a project um, typically? Yeah, it most definitely depends, but typically it is the po it's post production mm -hmm. and it's the post of the post production. So it is after they've had a cut. And sometimes that has to do with um, the, you know, the tunnel vision of, you know, directors and producers, like, let's just worry about getting this movie financed. Let's just worry about getting this movie shot. Let's just worry about getting this movie edited. Mm -hmm. And then we'll worry about getting it scored right. and, and sound design. And that's a, and that's a fair way to look at it. Um, 
I always like to be involved as early as possible, even if I'm not writing music, but just to read scripts, have mm -hmm. conversations, see early footage, see rough cuts, you know, that never hurts. Um, <laughs> I take that back and we can get into that more. Mm -hmm. It can, it can hurt a little bit, but it, it always uh, helps more than it hurts. And just to get ideas percolating, to have time to let ideas come and to try things out, like, in a spare moment, even when I'm working on one project, I mm. might be tinker tinkering at the piano and all of a sudden I hear an idea that I'm like, oh, it's not right for what I'm working on, but maybe it's good for this other movie that I have coming in a month right. or a year. And I'll put that and I'll file that away for a rainy day. Um, yeah, but typically it's it's post-production. It's I, we have a picture. We have a temp score. Mm. We're looking for a composer to finish this off. And, and that's when I step in. How can it hurt being involved early on? Is it because it affects what you're writing in a way, like where you feel like you get boxed in? Like, how is it affecting you in a negative way, potentially being involved too early on? Um, the the main example of being involved really early was on this latest, um, not Curse Friends, which is the latest project, but the the movie I did before it called Supercell. That's my friend Jamie Winterstern's uh, feature debut. I've known him since USC. We've been working together for 14 years. And so as soon as, I mean, he told me about this project when it was just an idea in mm. his head. And then I got to read scripts and all the things I just mentioned. I, I was with him every step of the way. And we were writing music every step of the way. Before there was even a script, I was writing music mm. just based on conversations. And in many ways, that was so helpful. We got to weed out ideas that weren't working and we got to come up with themes and come up with a sound and, and reference music. And that was all very helpful. It did end up hurting just a little bit mm. in the, um, mainly because the movie that he had in his head when we started the process was not quite the movie that ended up on camera or in the edit. It was, mm -hmm. the tone was a little bit different. Uh, the style was a little bit different. Um, and so some of the, the tone of the music that we had written was wrong now. And right like I personally, I, I get my best ideas reacting to picture because mm -hmm. that is ultimately what is guiding um, the story and the tone is what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So um, to work before picture, um, th that was a pitfall that some of the ideas that we thought were good ended up having to be thrown out. And then it did take some recalibrating to get back into like, what is the right frame of mind and the right sure. uh, tone and, and harmonic language uh, musical language that's going to fit in this movie yeah uh, and the same goes for working on early edits um because i i was working on on supercell a year ago october when and then we didn't get a uh, locked cut until late january and <laughs> when we got locked cut there was a couple scenes that had actually moved around and the mm. storytelling order of a couple things had changed. Uh, a couple scenes had actually been dropped and, you know, that did throw off some of the work that I had done, right. not just in a, I mean, things get edited and you have to conform, redo the music all the time, but this was more than that. This was like recalibrating how the music is interacting with the visuals and the story right. because the story had changed. Yeah. So it, it hurt a little bit in that respect, but all in overall, it was minimal damage and, and it, the time spent extra time spent on that paid off big time. The other thing that can happen is just how like a temp score that an editor would put mm -hmm. into a movie. They live with that for months to or years and you can have temp love where a director mm. falls in love with the temp score and they can also get so sick of the temp score because they've been listening to it for a year. Right. And, the, and the same thing can happen to a piece of music that you write early on in the process. Cause now I, I in about May of 2020, I wrote what was the, ended up being the main theme for Supercell and we didn't, you know, finish till May of 2022. Mm. So it's, there's a risk there that you're going to get really sick of that piece of music after right. two years of listening to it. But fortunately that didn't happen. It's stuck. And, and we both really love it, you know, right. to this day. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I'm curious on that side. So like I've done like video editing with stock tracks, like always, like it's always been, that's what I'm using. That's what I'm using. So I'm editing 
to the music a lot of times like i'm editing to match certain beats and things and then you're coming in and then it's already happened you know probably with the temp track and something you're going to come in and and do your magic too um I, i'm always curious like you mentioned like the helicopter sequence in jurassic park you know or i think of uh, i think of moments in films that are so tied to the score you know like think i mean think of jaws you know like these moments where it's like it's so in sync with what you're seeing what you're hearing is that just a matter of you like are you working in coordination with the editor and giving them a track to cut to at any point or are you just adjusting your music to match their edit like where's the give and take there in the push and pull because like i've watched so much behind the scene and i'm always like yeah but how like in this helicopter moment jurassic park how are they deciding to pull that music back? Are they just watching on the screen and stopping there? Are they sending to the editor saying, this is the music, like cut it to it. Like wh where's that balance and in, in collaboration between you and the editor? Cause I have to imagine that's a lot of conversation back and forth. It can be um, <clears throat> 99 times out of a hundred um, editorial and music are completely separate and mm. also not, in sync so in other words get i get an edit to work with and then hopefully it's locked cut um and then i'm working off of something that gotcha. is already cut what you're talking about does happen and has happened um you know famous examples um like uh, hans zimmer on gladiator he worked very much in tandem with the editor um he as insofar as i remember he brought in editing bay into the studio so that he could work next door to the editor and uh, have that back and forth collaboration. Um, we're not, we don't always have those resources. Uh, but, It'd be a little um, and, expensive <laughs> to and to, yeah. to some of your, and in some of your older examples, um, like uh, the ET bike chase, for example, mm -hmm. another famous um, editing music example, uh, they were on the stage recording uh, that, that cue and, that was before um, you had ways to just, um, you know, correct. I, I stand corrected. I know, I know that to that they, John Williams is doing what's called free conducting where he's not using a click track, using something called streamers to align hit points and conducting, watching the picture and, and trying to coordinate his conducting with what he sees mm -hmm. on the picture. And, and, have, and the streamer will come across this, um, the screen and when mm. it hits the end, there's a there's a pop, there's a dot that happens that that's your sync point. This is before digital, you know, yeah. workstations, and you know they were recording that, and they were having the hardest time getting it in sync. So famously, uh, Steven Spielberg says, "Just create the music, do what you need to do, and we'll edit the, the chase, you know, out it after the." So, it can go both ways sure uh, but but especially with digital workflow now um it's mostly common to just get a piece of locked footage and then put music to right. it yeah i get stressed out whenever i think of anything pre-digital like <laughs> whenever i think of the workflow of that like especially editing like when i start thinking like actually cutting and splicing and taping film it <laughs> i keep break out in hives <laughs> thinking about it um i, I want to continue the conversation about collaboration for a second and um you've worked on a lot of projects where you're coming in and assisting doing additional music especially like television where there's established music like you've worked on the walking dead you know with bear mccreary and and you know had those collaborations um what is it like stepping in where, you know, there's already an established style score and or theme and coming in and doing that extra music? Do you feel like that is a great, like, it's a great way to be creative inside the box and those restrictions are helpful? Or is it something where you're like, man, I really want to do this, but there's already all these guidelines and rules. Like, do you feel, I guess, confined by that? Or do you thrive under that like getting to work in tandem with somebody who's already established you know a set score or theme i i kind of hate to go a little intellectual and go broad but every project no mm -hmm. matter whether you're under those conditions or it's your own movie and i 
and this is audio medium, so you can't they can't see that I'm putting own in um, in air quotes here because no project that you're doing, no no score that you're making is yours in the sense that it, mm. it has to serve the picture and it has to serve the director. And on, and on a bigger scale, you know, you have producers and studio executives that all have opinions. So it's not, it doesn't really technically belong to you. You might be the medium, you know, it's like, the, the like I said, director has a dramatic language and then you mm. interpret that into music and then um, et cetera. But um, yeah, so every project comes with a box and you're mm. put into a box. Maybe the temp score they they everybody loves the temp score and, and yeah, now they you use john williams just, for the temp score the exactly. whole time and, you know? <laughs> and now you have to mimic that so right. every, everything comes with with direction parameters and restrictions so um yeah generally having parameters is is healthy and great to have a starting point because everything there are way too many options musically mm -hmm. and out there you have to start somewhere so given either yourself, either director or the movie or yourself putting you into a box like, okay, this is going to be an orchestral mm -hmm. score. It's going to be a thematic score. Um, somebody loves the oboe. We're going to feature the oboe, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. absolutely healthy to have those kind of parameters and go from there. Um, but to add to what you're saying, yeah, a show like The Walking Dead that's been running for a, now it's in 11th season. So yeah. it has it has a very specific sound and style that has been established and you're stepping in to help uh you know as an additional writer i i don't feel like creatively stifled because it's not my job as an additional writer to have that creative input like my dad always put it that i'm being hired both as a contractor and as a consultant on any mm -hmm. given job the ratio of that will change like how much input creatively as a consultant someone wants from you hopefully a good amount because mm -hmm. you i'd like to think uh, anybody would like to think that they have creative you know um per, per perspective to to offer but um it, sometimes it, it literally just comes down to contracting work like i want this type of music you know i want it to hit here i want it mm -hmm. to have the emotional thing here and to be out here and that's what I'm telling you to do. And that's what you do. And when you're an additional writer, it can be very much like that. You're just a contractor coming in to, you know, help fill a role. And um, I will add that specifically on walking dead, there was that box that we're talking about was pretty big. Like mm. there is a certain palette of weirdness, you know, to the zombies and, a lot of like aggression and distortion and um, dissonance in a lot of these action scenes. But that vague kind of terminology is, is almost it. Like, mm. so just kind of being able to just contribute sounds and contribute stylistically to that set palette without being boxed in to use this theme or that sound specifically um, was really um, wonderful creatively as well as contract as a contractor um you know just for the record though there i remember you know there's a, a like a, a folder of, of sounds like walking dead sounds and instruments and things mm -hmm. that have been long established as being part of the musical palette so mm -hmm. if you use those you know you have a almost 100 percent guaranteed success rate of sounding like what has come before um, and the same goes for you know, the movies and or the video games that I, I helped out with, you know, they, you know, Bear McCreary sets the tone, he sets the style, writes the themes, mm -hmm. has the artistic and creative direction. And then it's up to us, you know, because there's so much music in so little time, you know, yeah. having, having extra hand, you know, is good. And, you know, just, just uh, following that direction that's given that those that parameters. I'm curious about that too. And this is just, uh, again, me, me being, I've just always wondered this. Um, so like a, a movie like army of darkness, you know, cause you mentioned like people come up with the theme, like, so army of darkness, Danny Elfman does this amazing opening score that sets the tone for the movie. And then Joe DeLuca does the re remainder of the soundtrack. Like he'd done for evil dead, evil dead two and mm -hmm. you know, Astro's mm -hmm. evil dead. Um, what's the purpose of bringing in someone on a movie? I get on a show because it's, a, like you said, 11 seasons, contracts and schedules and things. You're going to switch hands a little bit. 
in a movie like when i watched army of darkness i was like why didn't joe deluca do the main theme like why is it danny elfman um why do they sometimes have someone come in to do like an overall score and then have someone come in to do the actual like soundtrack for the film i can't speak to that specific example and because i don't know and (laughs) if if we've learned anything it's that from this conversation it's that every situation although there's general rules and guidelines like wildly everything different. is everything yeah. is mildly different you say wildly or mildly wildly different <laughs> oh I, I wouldn't say wildly but there are everything is case by case and every situation has its own unique quirks based on who's involved yeah. and 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 why you know there's so many logistics involved in terms of scheduling mm-hmm. um money and creative uh decision making that you know everything has its reasons so um you know, if I would have to venture a guess, I would say that, you know, Sam Raimi wanted the Danny Elfman sound for the theme. You know, he wanted mm-hmm. that 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 in that thumbprint on the movie, but you know, maybe he was booked on something else yeah. uh, and didn't have time to do sure. it. <laughs> you know, right, uh, right. <laughs> that would be one of the only reasons. Um it could have been a financial thing. I don't know about back then. Um Certainly sure. now, I know sometimes bigger name composers are hired for a theme because, uh, and that's all they can uh, a production can afford, and right. then they'll have someone else flesh out the score. Not always it's is that public, you know. In that example sure. you referenced, it's a very public thing. Sometimes it's an internal thing with um, a composer and his team or her team. Um, and I know you know the fa- the famous you know Hans Zimmer system where he, his company remote control, previously media ventures, you know, it's, it's famous for being that old, actually old fashioned studio system. Like what, when Alfred Newman was running, running 20th century Fox, he was the head of the music department and he had, you know, the whole music team under his supervision and from writers, orchestrators, copyists, even the orchestra, you know, back then they were contracted to the studio. So, um, you know, Hans really brought that back with his um, his venture, his media venture, sure. and, and has his team all working under him to serve his vision as you know the supervising composer. And um, so sometimes it's more public than not. There's a great Vanity Fair article that came out last year that um, shed some light into mm-hmm. the you know secret underbelly of of ghostwriting. Uh, yeah. If for some reason, the uh, composition world, the music department world has had this kind of secrecy when it comes to ghostwriting, where, you know, on in, in, like, there's a, always a lead animator and then an animation department. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lead, a head writer, and then there's a writing, a writer's room. Yeah. You know, it's not uncommon to have people working under the supervision of a department head, but for some reason, um, I don't know what it is, but this this idea that the composer is an artist that is doing everything him or herself uh, is kind of perpetuated. And mm-hmm. when in reality, it's a department like any other, and right. it has to come it has to come out on time, and it has to come within budget. Mm-hmm. And however many people it takes to accomplish that, you know, is what yeah. it takes. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, I want to talk really quick before I move us into our rapid round um, a little bit about Cursed Friends and approaching that project because um, you've got a Comedy Central, you know, comedy, and then the score has this very, like, it it feels like a score that you would hear in a traditional horror Halloween movie. So, like, uh, tell me about, like, approaching that project and kind of the the um the style and aesthetic and maybe inspirations that you brought into that project specifically yeah um that's a great question and um it actually goes way back to when i was in usc we went over to theodore shapiro's studio and met him and i asked him what it was like to score these comedies like Mm -hmm. old school and dodgeball and tropic thunder but they're comedies, but when you listen to music, mm-hmm. it's sports, action, drama. Like, like beautiful scores, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're traditional dramatic scores. They're just kind of applied to comedies. And 
you know, I, I asked him if he was pigeonholed and it, like he was thought of as a comedy guy, even though he's not technically writing comedic mm -hmm. music per se. I will. Um, so that was kind of a similar situation here. Like just because the movie's funny doesn't mean that the it's funny because the music's funny. Right. Right. Um, it's really more of the interaction, the counterpoint between the dialogue and the music that makes it funny. It makes it just how a joke is landing there's a precursor and then a joke lands the music's participation in that um has to work together in concert to make sure that that joke lands um probably the funniest thing that we did throughout the movie was just allow space for jokes to happen like you have the music building up to something and then it drops out or gets quiet and mm -hmm. it gives that kind of punch that absence of music allows the punch of the punchline to, yes. to be clear and really funny. And one time we went to that well a few times, only once did we go to the actual hard cut where the music was building and swelling really dramatically. And then it literally just gets cut off like dry yeah. with no tail. And that is towards the end of the movie. And I think that that makes that particular joke, even especially extra funny, right. but um, talk about inspiration, you know, uh, John Kaysen, the editor, he did like a phenomenal job um, uh, temping this this movie. And and like me, he's brought the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. influences to it. Uh, a lot of Danny Elfman in yeah. the temp. Um, specifically, The Frighteners was one of the things mm -hmm. he leaned on the most. And I absolutely adore that score. And that film is so much fun. It's like there's something about horror music when it becomes zany and tongue-in-cheek yeah it stops being scary and it starts being fun like having like this really dramatic brass cluster blah, you know that is mm. meant to be like shocking when you go over the top one extra degree when you turn it up to 11 it kind of starts being a little cheesy and that mm -hmm. can that works in a comedy that that little extra commute that uh, flair that tongue-in-cheek flair i think makes things a little funny and not so scary. Right. Um, so Danny Elfman, a big influence. Um, Chris Young, another huge influence. And, and Sam Raimi as well. I wanted um, to ask because the opening titles reminded me a lot of Christopher Young's score in Drag Me to Hell, like that tone a little bit. Uh -huh. Like it doesn't sound identical, but there was like little hits where I was like, I'm getting those vibes from it. it it makes me very happy and also a little sad that you picked up on that because I don't want to be, you know, plagiarizing or accused. I want to be accused of stealing. I want to be my own, you know, composer, right, right. but I would be lying if I said the drag me to hell score um, was not a huge influence, not only on this. I mean, there's a seance scene, a comedic right. demon possession scene that is very similar to the drag me to hell scene. Um, it's much funnier in our movie, but yeah, it, it's obviously influenced by Drag Me to Hell. Um, so when I was in USC, uh, Christopher Young was one of our teachers and we would go to his studio every week. And um, part of his uh, shtick as a, a USC pr professor, he was one of the only ones that was very active in like mm -hmm. big studio movies at the time. So his thing was, you know, I'm going to show you as as we learn all year, I'm going to also give you a window into what I'm doing on this movie, whatever movie I'm working on. And at the time in 2008, 2009, it was dragged me to hell. And so I got to see behind the scenes, the mm -hmm. whole process of him working on that movie. And then after graduating, that was my first music job was being an assistant for him. And oh, wow. uh, sp specifically for his class, like his USC class, I was his classroom assistant for, mm -hmm. for years and uh, every year we would talk a lot about Drag Me to Hell and I pr prepare materials about, you know, this is the spotting session. This is how the demos work. This mm -hmm. is um, the process of scoring that film. So that, that score in and out is burned into my subconscious mm -hmm. and, and consciousness. So yeah. it's not even subconscious. Like I, I, I figured it out even afterwards in that theme, da, 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 just that half step mm -hmm. up and down is... is you know, very similar to, to the theme for, you know, Drag Me to Hell. So uh, by no means is this an admission of guilt legally. <laughs> I have to say that. Uh, 
as a disclaimer, but <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, the influence big, is there, just like there's influences influence. from the visual side of horror yeah. as well. And yeah, in, in what I liked about that, though, when I was when I started watching it is, you know, I liked that the music wasn't in on the joke because uh, like the music is playing like this is, you know, there's fun to it, but it's like mm -hmm. it's still taking it seriously and there's nothing i hate more musically than when i'm watching something especially comedy comedy does this i think the most noticeably for me is when there's always something in the background reminding you it's funny where it's like boom 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 you know like that kind of like they're kind yeah. of they're stepping around and the, it, there's never a time to breathe it's constantly shouting like this is a funny this is a comedy and you know a lot of older movies when someone's like even when someone's riffing back and forth in a conversation there's like this little like slide whistle that comes in all of a sudden or this like <laughs> it, it, and that drives me nuts and what i loved in your approach was like i'm like if i'm listening to the soundtrack it's a horror movie like it's it's that's fine um and then also too you said those moments to breathe like early on in the film it, when they're in the bar and they're dancing and they're like, there's a slow-mo dance montage where reunited. And then there's that moment where like, it just cuts to the bar and they're mm -hmm. like, they're just dancing and it's just like dead silent. Like yeah, those moments, like a lazier approach, I feel like would have been like, here's some musical cue to remind you that that's funny. You know, <laughs> like there's this record right. scratch or there's this thing. So um, yeah, I, re I really, I really appreciated the score and, and I loved sensing those influences. Like it was very much its own thing while also you're getting these tastes of familiarity, which I think is important for, for parody, especially, or, or yeah. homage like that. Um, I know we have just a few minutes left. I'm going to, we're going to go through this rapid round very rapidly. Um, I have a couple okay. of quick questions for you. Um, first and foremost, and I'm going to twist this a little bit. So I usually ask people, if you have the green light to remake any film, what would you choose and why? I'm going to flip and say, if you could rescore any film or reinterpret a score for any film, what would you choose and why? Oh, easy. Um, the Princess Bride. Mm. Um, that may be the best best movie and i don't want to throw shade um but it's not the best score mm -hmm. i think that the theme the the romance romantic mm -hmm. theme the love theme i think is amazing and it just sounds like it, it it's plodding along a little bit like um somebody who kind of understands how to score films but it's not done with like the mastery Mm -hmm. of like the top comedic and fantasy film composers of that time. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean no disrespect and I apologize for sounding a little mean perhaps, but um, I do, I do think that that score could be improved and that movie could be improved with some um, better scoring. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not re not melodically. Like I said, I think yeah. the theme is amazing and memorable mm -hmm. um, and I just think a, a, a beautiful orchestral treatment of that could, could really elevate that score. Yeah. That, mm. that movie. Uh, which of your projects do you think is the best representation of you as a creator? Which is my part? Um, definitely one. So I, I, I kind of live in two halves. I am, was traditionally, um, you know, uh, academically, I was trained as an orchestral composer, mm -hmm a composer of, of notes, you know, of, <laughs> yeah. of melody. And that's my first love always. Um, you asked me who my, my three greatest uh, influences were in terms of artistry. And I, I picked two giants. And then mm -hmm. my third one was uh, Freddie Viederman, who is a fantastic composer and may well be a giant one day. Um, but it's not necessarily because of his music that he's an influencer. It's because he was one of our teachers at USC mm -hmm. and he taught me, uh, taught us and me specifically, cause I had never heard of it before. He taught me what sampling is. Mm -hmm. He taught me how you can record something and then use digital tools to turn that sound into other sounds. And that was like unlocking, you know, a treasure chest. It's like a portal to another world. So um, from there, I just have incorporated that idea into especially horror scores. You know, mm -hmm. The idea of just recording 
anything really from sounds you hear in the kitchen, your own voice, mm-hmm. um, you know, sound, sounds found in nature, and then using both digital and analog tools to transform, mutilate, create new things, slow down, reverse, you know, pitch up, pitch yeah. down. It unlocks an entire new universe of sound. Um, so my, my score to the movie Arctic from a few years ago is like something that it's like 90% is just all sounds that I made um, in different ways and not really using commercial sounds. Mm. And I think that that gives it a very distinct flavor and represents me very specifically because it's not just, it's one thing to take the tools from like um, a commercial sample library and to to use your, your skill with them to express yourself. That's definitely legitimate, you know, creative Mm -hmm. musical approach um but for me i get a little bit of extra satisfaction if i also made the sounds it's like eating a salad that you you grew all the ingredients in your garden you know you like you nurtured it and you grew it developed it and now you're seeing the fruits of your labor or the vegetables of your labor to continue the (laughs) the metaphor Right. Right. Um, right and then at the same time um either cursed friends or this uh supercell what we were talking about those really represent my flair for um, orchestra and melody and orchestration and color. And uh, I had just they're very different scores, but you know, that approach, that traditional musical approach, not just sound design approach uh, was the key um, for those scores. And yeah, they're very important to me. Awesome. Um, what is a, uh, and again, I'll tweak this a little bit. What's uh, so I always ask, what's a movie your di- uh, like your diehard fans would be surprised to enjoy. I want to flip this for people who appreciate your music and the musical style that you contribute. Is there a certain score or like film soundtrack that people would be shocked to know that you really appreciate, or you've been deeply influenced by? Um, oh, that I love and that I was influenced by. Yeah. Not, not of my work. Of no, not of yours. Work. So like if someone's like, okay, oh, right. I get some of your influences. I see your kind of style. And then right. you're like, I really love this obscure score from this movie. That's really cool. Oh man. Can we come back to that one? <laughs> sure. Yeah, we'll come back to that one. Um, I'll ask you a no less easy question. What do you think is the best decade of film history? Oh, that's an easy one. Oh. Um, it's the 90s, hands mm, down. Really? And c- coincidentally, I was aged 13 to 19 during that decade. Go figure. But um, even I try to think objectively about it. Like that was the peak of the technolo- the t- of the older technology developing into new technology. Mm-hmm. That was the peak of that. So all the the peak of the analog era yeah. you know st- uh, filming on film um yes there were groundbreaking visual effects happening in the 90s but only in service of tactile physical mediums like jurassic park yeah. it gets mentioned in this light all the time because it's true i watched jurassic park five times last year um I just referenced my letterbox to know that, but five times because it holds up amazingly well because you don't see, you know, silly CGI, you know, creatures, you see Mm -hmm. dinosaurs and you still see dinosaurs to this day. The, the, the animatronics combined with um, the visual effects, groundbreaking visual effects uh, make that extremely, uh, you know, classic and, and, and holds up. So, um, you know, I just miss when movies, were filmed in places like you Mm -hmm. could see that they're there and you're being taken not to a fantasy world but to an actual world like (laughs) it kind of drives me nuts when when you can tell that the the people are just not there and i i like to be able to see that they're there right that the water is there you know augmenting augmenting with with some visual effects is fair game but you know i just prefer that tactile yeah. approach and and that 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 definitely is evident in like my love for um like synth synthesizers and turning mm-hmm. knobs and analog real sounds and not i don't want things to sound plastic i don't want it to sound like it's a digital fakery of something else i want it to sound real and authentic oh excuse me there you go and um 
yeah, I think that comes from that 90s aesthetic. And even though this Curse Friends was geared maybe towards people that grew up in the 2000s, it um, all, all the people that made it were, you know, yeah, 90s right. generation. <laughs> and I think that John, again, John Kaysen, who did a great job with the temp score, you know, he put in all his favorite music from the 90s and the 80s, you know, stuff mm-hmm. that I grew up listening to and loved. And I felt an instant connection to that material um, straight away. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, this is the question I ask everybody that comes on the show. I always end with this question. What's the number one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker who's listening to this conversation? I would say patience. Mm -hmm. It's not with, you know, the, the minority of people get that quote, big break and get it early. Um, Some people get that big break later. Most people, it is a series of small breaks that happen over time, meeting that person, connecting to this person, this project goes somewhere that someone saw and then you connect with them. And it's just like a series of expanding the network, expanding the number of people that like you, that know you. And maybe as I'm saying it, I will change my answer. Be likable, you know, be a fun person to hang out with, to collaborate with. You know, this is not, if you want to be an artist and write your own music, then do that, you know, find a way to do that. But if you want to collaborate with other people who have opinions and have creative um, direction and be a part of a team, you know, then this is a good industry because you see it in the credits on every movie. Mm -hmm. It takes, it takes a village to make anything. Um, So I would say be patient Try not to compare to other people, even not only your contemporaries, but especially not prior generations. The industry is tied to technology and tied to the economy. So any era of filmmaking is specific to that, what I just said, you know, that specific economy and that specific technology. So you cannot compare how someone's career arc went um, John Williams in the 40s, you know, or right. in the 50s to now versus someone who's starting off today. It's just a completely different world, mm-hmm. completely different um, career paths. So um, would it be easy for me to think that I'm a nothing composer because I'm not Ludwig Göransson, who's actually younger than me, but has, you know, three fourths of an EGOT already, you know, mm. that would be easy for me to say, like, I'm obviously worthless because I'm not as good as him or as, as, um, as successful as him. But, you know, everybody's path is different. Everybody's a career takes shape in their own way. And success is measured in lots of different ways. Like yeah. is your success measured in gold statues or is it measured in a stable lifestyle? Is it measured in mm. having the opportunity to be creative on a daily basis and enjoy the people you work with, or, you know, you, you define and learn to redefine how your success is defined and how your happiness is defined. Um, again, being patient and, and giving yourself that time to kind of reevaluate as you go along. Uh, people leave the industry all the time because they realize it's not for them. And that's not because they're quitters. It's because, you know, it, it takes a certain person and it takes a certain lifestyle to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Love that advice. Well, thank you so much. I know we went a little bit over. I appreciate you taking the time to give that answer and uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, I hope for anybody listening, that they'll check out uh, some of your work. They probably heard some of it already, uh, depending on what they watch and, and check out. Uh, but thanks again so much for for taking the time to do this. Appreciate Can it. I, if I could answer I still don't have a great answer for that question about (laughs) um, what score you might be surprised about, Mm -hmm. but I will say it's the social network, Mm -hmm. uh, the Trent Reznor, Etika Ross, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily apply now because I've done so much work with synth and, Mm -hmm. you know, that I've kind of become part of that world in the last decade. But if you go back in time at the time, 2010, I had, I was really just an orchestral composer and I didn't really know what synths were or how to make those sounds, how to do that, that world. And, but I love that score and I yeah. absolutely, and, and keep some of the hardcore traditionalists were uh, upset that like how to train your dragon or mm-hmm. inception didn't win best score, mm-hmm. but remember it's called best original score. 
And yeah. at the time, that was the most original thing that we had seen in Hollywood for a long time. And they pretty much changed the game in terms of the way Hans had done, the way John Williams did, you know, changed the game on what is it film music can be or should be or, it, you know, is. And uh, I got that score temped for in projects of mine for years to come. And mm. I, I'm really happy that I was led down that path by by them and by people who liked that that and were like, oh, I want this to have a social network vibe because like, I've yes, learned perfect. <laughs> now I've I've learned to really love that approach and those mm -hmm. sounds. And and it's been a great addition to the arsenal, not just to be an orchestral composer, but to also be a sound designer and a synthesis. Yeah. So I will say that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so Thank much. You. And uh, again, and look forward to seeing Supercell when it comes out. Look forward to seeing your work uh, moving forward and uh, know my audience will as well. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. And congratulations on a year of the pod. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I Just appreciate Just over a that. year. Yeah, it's been crazy.